typical speaker that's going to stand behind the podium, except when I do my uh, honorary thank yous in just a moment. But I want to thank you for having me here. Would you all do me a favor? Would you please stand up for just a minute? Because I know you just had lunch. I know that you're probably a little bit groggy. I know you're thinking, oh my God, I got to sit through another speaker. How am I going to do this? I believe you can do it. So what I'd like you to do is to take a very deep breath with me. <sighs> Breathe in one more time. And one more life breath, please. The breath of life. And then just feel how your body's flowing a little bit differently. And then please turn around and greet someone and say hello to them and give them some of your blessings. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. As I said, my name is Stephen D. Rogers, and I am here from San Diego, California. I am honored to be here. I want to make sure I get the dignitaries right to say thank yous. But the first person I have to uh, thank is the RID director, Mr. Basker. I just call him Basker, Mr. Basker, who I met in the Philippines, who I'm going to talk about again in a few minutes. But uh, he is a very gracious man and a very strong leader and a big-hearted man. And I want to thank you for the invitation, so thank you so much. Um, I also want to thank, thank you, thank you, Basker. I also want to thank uh, PDGR um, Thena, I think is how I, he said I could say his name that way. Uh, and he was phenomenal on coordinating back and forth as the chairman of this organization to help me get coordinated with all the details. He was just on the spot, so thank you for that. And I know there's many other dignitaries in the room, uh, international presidents Ian Risley and TRF chairman Paul Netzel, and many other dignitaries here. I just met a gentleman from Seattle as well. So thank you very much, and I'm honored to all of you that you are in this room, so thank you for that. So one of the things that I wanted to make sure we were talking about today was the power of doing well by doing good. And that's the message of what Rotary is all about. So I'm definitely gonna be talking about that message in my talk. I also wanna make sure that I'm tying in a message about a book that I wrote called From Lead to Gold. And the concept of lead to gold comes from, is that working now? I think you, you can just put it on my back belt. Um, the concept of lead to gold came from a word that I love and a concept that I love, which is alchemy. Has anyone ever heard the word alchemy? So alchemy is the formula, thank you so much, is the formula of turning lead into gold. And back in ancient days, it was the, the alchemists used to be able to have the myth that they could turn lead into gold. Now lead is valuable, but gold is to perceive more valuable. So I ended up naming my company Alchemy Advisors, and that's what I do now. I'm a consultant and a coach and a speaker and a writer, and I help people go from challenge situations to better opportunities. Or if they're in a great situation, how do we go to even a more intense, wonderful situation? So how do you turn lead into gold? And how do you do well by doing good? And in your businesses here, all Rotarians that I have met are phenomenal business leaders. You are owners of companies, you are presidents, you are CEOs, you are executives, uh, and some of you are spouses of uh, these people and gentlemen in the room. And the spouses also, some of them have their own businesses. And I have found that the people of India are a very united unit, that they really understand how to make the alchemy of life work within the family within their communities, within their businesses. And I've been extremely impressed of learning more and more about your culture and understanding the power of alchemy. So I'm gonna come back to that in a few minutes, but I wanted to uh, jump into here, uh, Mr. Basker. I got to meet him in the Philippines and he was speaking on behalf of your country, India, and he was talking about polio, he was talking about leadership, he was about connecting countries together. And I was so impressed because when he spoke, they listened. Uh, so that was really great to see people go uh, from one country to another and to have that unity. He also was on stage being honored in very many different ways throughout the, uh, the event. And also, one of the things that was really wonderful is that when we got to connect, when I first was speaking, uh, Basker was at my table, at the VIP table, before I got up to speak, and he was very serious. And he had this very serious look on his face, and I thought, oh, I'm not sure if he's going to like my speech or not, because maybe a little too over the top for him. And when I got off the stage, he very kindly came up to me and told me he enjoyed my... This is where he asked me, uh, I think, in the next few minutes if I'd like to come to India. So I was thinking, wow, India, I've always wanted to go to India, it's my bucket list. And then he invited me and I said yes, and I would have come anyway. And then he told me it was in Kuala Lumpur. So here I am, just as a wonderful place. But thank you so much for that invitation. So thank you again, Basker. 
Can we try and get this other, I'm going to have to move around a lot, so hopefully you guys can help me with this mic. Um, also, I want to thank the Rotary team. That you, as a unit again, the alchemy of life. The Rotary team was here welcoming me as soon as I got off the plane. My, my wife, Mary Lou, and myself came right off the plane, and the welcoming committee was here to greet us. So thank you for that. Also, I was found out that I was coordinating with Balaji and his wife, Banu, who have my, been my great friends and great aides. They started out to just be hosts, and they've become good friends of ours. So thank you. They greeted us here in the lobby, and we also went on a tour. I was able to go to the temple, and this is us carrying the bricks up the 200-some-odd steps and putting the bricks up at the top. So thank you again to both of you. Also, I want to talk about um, something first before I go into this. Can you guys help me with this mic? Because it's really important I'm going to be able to move around the stage. I might have to use the handheld mic possibly. Okay, let's improvise. How about if we do this? I'll just use this mic. Hello, can you hear me now? Okay, let's improvise. Lead to gold. Lead to gold. Take a challenge, turn it into something different if you have a challenge, right? Turn it into an opportunity. So how many of you in your businesses or in your organization have had issues or challenges that have ever held you back? Anything ever held you back? Show of hands. Anyone ever had any obstacles of anything holding you back? Okay, I should be able to get 100% on that. Has anybody ever had a challenge? Okay, within that challenge, how many of you have ever experienced fear? Has anyone ever in their life experienced fear? Can I get a show of hands on that one? Okay, let me ask you this. What do you think the top three or four fears are? And if you know the answer, just it, it, there's no wrong answer, raise your hand and yell it out to me, that people have throughout the world of fear. What are, what's the top one? Public speaking, thank you. I got over that one early on, so yes, that is a very big one. What's another fear? Fear of failure. How many of you have had major success in your life and you are sometimes fueled by the power of fear of failure? Has anyone ever had that experience? You've created this success and you're wondering, oh my God, is it gonna get taken away or am I gonna be able to maintain it? That fear fuels. What's one other fear? Any other fears you can think of? Fear of rejection. Absolutely. As human beings, we all want to be loved. We want to be appreciated. We want people to appreciate who we are and what we do. And sometimes the fear of rejection allows us to not always go into our full expression of ourself because we have fear holding that back. One of the things I had was a fear of heights. And so one of the things I'm going to tell you about is a story that when I was a uh, a gentleman, probably, how old was I? I was maybe about 15 years younger than I am now. And I was actually a much bigger dude than I am now. At one point in my life, I was over 300 pounds. So I was uh, a much bigger guy. But my daughter had just turned 16. And my daughter had always wanted to go skydiving. And she convinced me when she turned 16 that I was going to go skydiving with her. So all of a sudden it's her birthday and we're in a car driving north and there's a little town called Paris Valley up in Temecula outside of San Diego. And we're driving up the mountain and I am petrified. Like how did I get into this? What's happening? Why am I doing this? And I'm driving up the mountain and we get to the place and they have this sit down. You have to fill out all these forms. You have an attorney and a lawyer saying this is very dangerous. Your insurance may not cover this. You could die, but have a good time. <laughs> And there's people lined up to do this. I'm in the room and they're lined up to do this. All of a sudden before, there's probably 30 people in the room. And all of a sudden he says, uh, sir, we have to weigh you. Well, they didn't have to weigh anybody else, but they were going to weigh me. So all of a sudden I'm like, oh, great. So not only my fear of heights, but talk about being humiliated of weighing yourself in front of 30 people. So I get on the scale and all of a sudden I'm thinking I was probably like 275, maybe 280. Didn't realize I got into 300. And I get on the scale and it's like, Beep, 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 beep. Not only is it 300, it's like 305. And I'm like, yes, yes, yes. It was the only time I was happy to be fat because he said, sorry, you're too fat, you can't go. <laughs> I was like, thank you, God. <laughs> thank you, God. And so all of a sudden, I didn't go. Fear held me back. My daughter went on the skydive, had a phenomenal time, and just had an over the top time. We're coming down the mountain. 
And as we're coming down the mountain, we're in the car and she says, dad, she goes, God, you're so successful in areas of your life, in your business and your affirmations that you do and your goals. When are you going to finally get your weight under control? I mean, I'm really getting worried that you can't live the life you want to live. So I made a promise to her that that and many other things that happened in my life, I was going to get my weight under control. So within about a year, I had dropped maybe 50 or 60 pounds. And this time it's my birthday. And all of a sudden it's my birthday time and I'm opening up my birthday card and everyone's singing happy birthday and I open my presents. And my daughter gives me a little gift certificate and in the card is a gift certificate. What do you think the gift certificate's for? Skydiving. Next day I know I'm back in the mountain, going up the mountain, I'm in the same spot. The attorney says, fill out the forms, do this. You could die, but have fun. This time he didn't say get on the scale because it looked like I could make it. Next thing I do, I'm being strapped up. I'm getting my gear on. I'm meeting this guy named Charlie. And Charlie says, Steve, you know, got to go through all these things. You're going to be tandem. You're going to be in the plane. I'm like, wow, oh my God, this is scary. My heart is just beating, just completely beating a mile a minute. We go, there's about 14 of us. The plane is... We get into the plane. I'm on a wooden bench and I'm sitting on the wooden bench. Charlie's next to me. My daughter's across from me. My terror is at a level I can't even explain. I am so petrified. Every cell in my body is freaking out. And all of a sudden I've got the altimeter on my arm and it's going 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 8,000, 10,000 feet. And I'm like, oh my God. My daughter all of a sudden sings, starts singing happy birthday. And the plane singing happy birthday with a the sound and happy birthday song. And then all of a sudden Charlie says, and the plane is just rattling and rattling. Charlie reminded me that I had to sit on his lap to get strapped in because we're going tandem. So the plane's like this, they're singing happy birthday, all kinds of noise. And I'm sitting on Charlie's lap getting strapped in and he whispers in my ear and says, this is my favorite part. I'm like, Charlie, oh man, what the heck? You know, stop that. And so all of a sudden I'm on Charlie's lap and he says, you got to stand up. So I stand up, he's strapped to me. I'm going down the aisle and all of a sudden you, the door opens up. Wind is gusting through, gusting through. I'm like, oh my God. And all of a sudden, they're still singing happy birthday because they kept singing over and over because I think they were so afraid they kept singing. All of a sudden, there's less and less people. Happy birthday to you. Less people, happy birthday. And all of a sudden, I'm seeing people flying out of the pain, flying out of the plane. I'm like, oh my God. We get to the very end and my daughter's right before me. And she's ready to get out of the plane and she's at the end. She looks over her shoulder at me and goes, and I'm like, oh, and wind and noise. I'm like, she's freaking out. Oh my God, she's having a tear attack. How can I help my daughter? Oh, and I'm thinking, you're on your own. Good luck, you know? And they, they throw her out of the plane. I'm then in the plane, in the doorway like this. I'm holding on with my hands, petrified. And they said, Steve, let go, let go. I go, no, Charlie, I'm not letting go. He says, rip off your finger. He rips off my fingers and the next thing, Pull the cord, pull the cord. Wow. Oh. Oh. Wow. And I'm just floating in the sky, having an aha moment. The fear that I had was gone. And on the other side of that fear was massive sense of power. My heart opened up, my mind opened up. I just was looking out of the horizon and Charlie says, turn right, pull the cord, turn left, pull the cord. And I'm looking there and in that moment, I thought everything is possible. Anything and everything is possible. And I went down with that feeling all the way to the ground and I slid in the ground on top of Charlie, who's under me, and I slide in. We get up, we're high-fiving each other, and we just had a phenomenal experience. And I was like, wow. Get in the car and driving back down the mountain. And I look at my daughter, I said, wow, that was so great. That was wonderful. How great was that? And she, I said, hey, Nikki, why did you freak out? Last time you went, you had no problem. What's going on? Well, a year or so had passed and she had really gotten very deep in understanding what she wanted to do in going to college, what she wanted to study. She knew she wanted to help children and she had since gone on to go down to Dominican. She'd been to Tahiti or to, not Tahiti, to um, Thailand. She'd been to various Mexico, to different places helping children. And she realized she possibly wanted to use her dance for traumatized children, impoverished children to help break through 
and what they were gonna do with their lives. And she had found her purpose. And she said, I realized I could die. I'm like, duh, did you not hear what the guy was saying? Sign the forms, you could die. But it wasn't that she didn't hear it, it was that it now meant something. Because her life now had purpose and she realized she could lose it and it'd be gone in an instant. And when you have purpose and you realize how valuable life is and how precious it is that God gave us each life in this room. And God, whatever you call God, and I know we have different religions in the room, but mostly Hindu, we have Christian, we have maybe Buddhist. But to me, the definition of God is just the sum of all that is. The sum of all that is. And whatever you determine that to be in your own fa faith and your own religion is fine. I believe having higher purpose and higher power is really what we're meant to do here, which is also being of service. So she found that she wanted to be of service. And so she had fear. My point in telling you that story is because Geronimo, we all have to jump out of planes. What's your skydive story? What are you most afraid of right now? Where's your biggest fear in your life right now? Ask yourself that question. Is it something to do with your family? Is it something to do with your finances? Is it something to do with your health? Is it something to do with your business? Is it a relationship? Is it not living up to something? Is it that you've overcommitted and you don't know how you're gonna live up to the commitment you've made? What is your biggest fear right now? And how do you break through that? Because once you break through fear, there is massive power. And on the other side of that power is where God says, here's where creation happens. Here's where things get to manifest and create and do and be. But here's what I realized. I used to run away from fear. I used to try and run away from fear. But what I realize now is fear is part of the process. It's part of the alchemy formula to make things happen. Fear is part of where the fuel comes from. And the bigger the fear, sometimes the bigger the power as to what you're supposed to be doing. Now in my life, I wake up in the morning or each week and I say, where am I most afraid? And I know that's where I need to go. I know that's where I need to go. Because in that spot is where I'm being called to higher purpose and higher meaning. So this is me and Charlie jumping out of the plane, having uh, no more fear, jumping through. Because again, as we talk about fear to power, that's really what I want to get the message about today. Doing well by doing good and understanding there's even fear in that. And the people that you're helping, you're helping build schools, you're helping clean water, you're helping with polio, you're helping in a many economic ways, you're helping with service. Many of the people you're helping are fearful. They're afraid. They don't know how they're gonna provide for their families. They don't know how they might educate their families. They don't know if a disease is gonna kill them. They have fear every day. You are the leaders. You are the leaders to help them through that process and help them get on the other side of their fear and they know that you're here to help so you can make a difference in their life. That is doing well by doing good. That is using your power for good in the world. And I want you to realize that everything you want is on the other side of fear. Jack Canfield, who wrote a book series, very successful, called Chicken Soup for the Soul, says this, everything you want is on the other side of fear. So don't, don't try and avoid it. This is what I say. I realize in addition to trying to break through fear, I also realized resistance came. And resistance is another word for fear. But I used to go, God, why is there so resistance? I have these goals and why am I getting roadblocks and why am I getting hurdles? Well, what I realize now is breaking through resistance is the price you pay for the dream you say you want. It's like getting your ticket punched. So the bigger the resistance, sometimes the bigger your dream. Do you really want it? Baskar was talking yesterday that the goal for India is 1.25 million. That's a big deal. That's a huge, huge undertaking. You're gonna have resistance. You're gonna have obstacles. You're gonna have skeptics. You're gonna be resistant. You're gonna think he made too big of a goal. You're gonna think, how are we gonna accomplish this? So, some days you think you'll be able to and other days you won't. But if you're tapping into the why, as the, the spiritual master talked about yesterday, if you're tapping into the why you're doing this to help more people, to be of servant leadership, to help change the world, you will find the fuel. It doesn't mean you're not gonna have resistance because you will. This is Marianne Wright Edelman. She says, service is the rent we pay for being. It is the very purpose of life and not something you do in your spare time. 
She was in the civil rights movement and she was someone who really knew what it was like to break through resistance and fear and pain. Um, because this whole session is talk about servant leadership, being of service, doing well by doing good. And this is uh, John Maxwell. He's a United States um, writer, author, speaker, he used to be a minister. And he says, a leader is one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. You're leaders in this room. You would not be here if you were not a leader. You obviously know that Rotary is a path for you, for fellowship, for making a difference, for contributing. You also need to now inspire others. The spiritual master, as he was talking about, people don't necessarily follow leaders, they follow followers. The more you have people moving in droves of people to go to something of higher purpose and higher cause and higher meaning, the more power that you have. This is something that I love. I have talked about being a servant leader for years. Back when I was the CEO of a Berkshire Hathaway company, and I'd risen the, the ranks of being a corporate America manager to eventually become a CEO of that company, I realized that along the path, I had to become servant leadership oriented. And if I, if I was not there to serve others, I was never gonna achieve the goals that they wanted or that I wanted. And I love this quote. Kevin Hall says, your gifts are not about you. Leadership is not about you. Your purpose is not about you but a life of significance about serving those who need your gifts and those who need your leadership and those who need your purpose is really what servant leadership is about. And that's what I think Rotary is, that definition there could be on a plaque in any Rotary Hall. Would you agree with me? So one of the things that Bob Proctor, he's a gentleman who's written a lot of books on self-development, personal growth and goals. I'm also on a couple committees with him um, on some other charitable work that we do with the Junior Achievement Organization and some other things. But he says this, your purpose explains what you're doing with your life. Your vision explains how you're living your purpose. Your goals enable you to realize your vision. This was talked a lot about yesterday and it's in complete alignment with what I'm talking about with your group today. So goals, what do we need to do when we have goals? Well, one of the things is defining your own expectations. All of you in this room have an annual theme, but I wanna talk about your own goals for yourself, your health, your personal growth, your relationships, your service, your own spiritual growth, your recreation and fun, your financial life and your career. How do you have these annual themes tied into your own lives and do you? How many of you own your own businesses as entrepreneurs or business owners? Can I see a show of hands? Okay. How many of you have some type of annual business plan or plan or budget that you do for your business? Okay, less of you. How many of you have a life plan where you actually have a written life plan out in these categories where you've got a written plan goal specific to what you want, what you're trying to create, how long it's gonna to take to get it and what it's gonna cost you in time, money, energy and effort. Does anyone have a life plan? One, two, a few. I would like to implore you today to think about this. Your life is powerful and meaningful and impactful but it will be gone in the blink of an eye. It will be gone rapidly and fast. So using that to the maximum for your ability, for yourself and your family and those around you to really create the life that you want, map out what you're looking for. Anything you can track and measure, you can improve upon. Anything that gets written down and monitored can create and happen. That's why companies do that with businesses all the time. I employ people all the time in their thought to say, why not have a life plan for yourself? Sometimes people plan more time planning their vacations than they do planning their life. So I would like to plant this seed for you that in helping people in Rotary, if you're using this concept for yourself, how could this also help other people when you're talking to groups or organizations or individuals or communities or schools? Because if you're not living a balanced life in your health and your spiritual life and your financial life, all of a sudden things start getting out of whack and things are not fulfilling. And sometimes we have what I call a hole in the soul. A hole in the soul is where we go, is this all there is? I thought there'd be something more. When I got to this level of success or when I had this relationship or when I did this, I thought I would be more fulfilled. Why am I not? That usually becomes a few of these areas because we're A, not living in balance. 
We're not completely in tune with our higher power. We're not living our authentic selves. We're not giving honor to God by being of the full service that we should be. Whatever those things are, you have to figure that out on your own path. But this is a powerful thing to understand and know. So the other path that I want to talk about here is what happens when that doesn't happen? This was me. Would you guys recognize me if you met me in the hall right now? Pain and pleasure. My life was not in balance at that time. I was climbing the corporate ladder. I was working extremely hard. I was getting the title. I was doing the work. I was going to the parties after work. I was shaking hands. I was making budgets. I was hiring people. I was getting stuff done. And I was completely out of whack in my life and completely in denial about it. I can be eight or 10 pounds or seven pounds overweight right now and I'm much more aware of it than when I was 100 pounds overweight. Denial is a powerful thing. And when you realize denial is in all of our lives, what are you denying? Where's your fat self, whatever that might be? Your finances, your health, your relationship, your marriage, whatever that might be, where might you be in denial about? And how can you change that? Here's what we're propelled by. We're propelled by two things, pain and pleasure. We're pulled by pleasurable things. And obviously I like to drink. You see me drinking a drink there. I like to eat. I liked prime rib. I liked the cheese. I liked pasta but I was out of control and not being aware of how to do that in discipline and balance. I obviously had a hole in the soul that I wasn't feeling in balance and in harmony. I got to be almost 350 pounds at one point in my life. That was about 18 years ago. I decided to make a change. And so the change was, this is back in the days when I had to realize I had to make a change and go from being fat. That was, I thought, well, do I look fatter with a beard or not a beard? So I had both kind of going back and forth. <laughs> Uh, so this, oh, now my clicker's not working. Can you guys click the next slide for me? So one of the things here that, um, can you guys click the next slide there in the back? Is how do you make a transition? How do you transition your life to the next step? Well, that's where you have to put a plan of attack. You have to put your written down what you're looking to create. You have to create the next steps as to where you want to go and what you're trying to accomplish. And you have to put an action plan in place. So I had to become aware. I had to look at my health and my finances. And then I had to get help. I had to get support. I quit drinking alcohol 14 years ago. I was also an overachiever in that area. I was getting too damn good at it and decided to stop it. And so I got help on that. After I got my alcohol in check, then I started working towards how do I get my health in check. I ended up slowly making a plan and getting stuff moving forward to transition in that because I knew I could do well by doing good if I was in better health. I knew I'd have more energy and I could help more people and I could do more things in corporate America and in my world. Gentlemen, can you try and get the PowerPoint working for me back so we can get the slides back on? Um, and so within that process, I realized that that was something I had to walk my talk. That was my old pants. So the transformation had to happen. One of the subtitles of my company is I help people transition, transform, and evolve to their highest good in life and business. Because I've had the pain. I've had the pleasure. I know what it's like to have alcohol issues or food issues or financial issues. We're all human beings. We all have sufferings. We all have inadequacies. We are never going to be perfect nor were we intended to be. God is the perfection of the universe, not us. Our mission is to transition and transform to our highest good and to help others do that as well. Would you agree with me? How many of you agree with that, 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 that that's part of our mission? Great. So I think that's a big part of what wrote is. So again, plan, change, actions, and new habits. We can all create new habits. I'm just looking at my timing here. Oh, let me go back to this. So one of the things we were, I was talking about earlier in business, um, well, we missed a slide there. This is the environment. So I was talking about this earlier. So you can see up here where it talks about yourself, your spirituality, your nature, et cetera. This is the ultimate life. My wife and I, every year between Christmas and New Year's, my wife Mary Lou's here in the back somewhere if she hasn't left, but, oh, there she is. Every year between Christmas and New Year's, we go and do this as a couple. We go to a hotel or to, a, to a, uh, a cabin somewhere or to a lake and we put flip charts all over the wall of our hotel room. We give each other a notepad and the first half of the day we write out, what do we want spiritually in our lives this year? What do we want as a couple? What do we want in our marriage? What do we want in our family? 
What do we want in our health? And we map out written step by step of what she wants in her own world and what I want in my own world. And then we meet up after the afternoon and then we get in our hotel room and we start writing them up on the flip charts. She puts up her goals, I put up mine. And then we figure out where we have common goals, where we want to make our family goals. And then we make our common goals. And she has hers and I have mine and we have them as a family. And then we review that and we work on that quarterly and we put it out very clearly about what we're trying to create. I would have never been able to create the success I created in my life of being a Warren Buffett CEO, building a company, losing weight, had I not followed this plan. You see, I'm a guy who barely graduated high school. I moved out of my house when I was 17 years old. My father was a very strong disciplinarian. I was talking, uh, remind me of your name again. John, thank you. Uh, Navy man here who's also visiting from Seattle, but also a, a director here from the United States. We were talking about the Navy, but my dad was a very strong military man. And he had this thing of, this is my house and these are my rules. And if you don't like it, you can leave. And I was like, wow, those are pretty intense rules. And now that I'm a grown man and have my own house, I think those are pretty damn good rules actually. But at the time when I was 17 years old, I decided to move out and leave. I tried to go to college and get that under my belt and it just never happened. I went to two or three years of college and I never was able to complete it. But then I was in the hotel service business and I learned how to serve people at a high level. I got into real estate and I helped people sell houses and buy the American dream. I became a leader in a company and I climbed the ladder of a path and eventually I went from being a manager to the CEO of a company of a Warren Buffett organization because I knew it was possible. And I knew it was worthy and I was worthy to have that happen in my life. And everyone has different paths. Everyone has different missions. Everyone has different callings. That happened to not be mine with being a college degree. I'm in complete awe of people who are academic and who have master's degrees and PhD degrees, PhD degrees, and understand that process and discipline. That was not my path. I had to have a path in a different way. The Wheel of Life, this is something that I use with my clients where I actually have them score on a monthly basis category on a scale of one to 10, the Wheel of Life. They put a little dot on each of these categories recreation, family, friends, fitness, and then we draw a line and a circle and we find out the wheel of life where they're most out of balance and where they're not out of balance and where they should start their plan at. So for 2018, it's right here. What will have occurred if, if you're sitting here now a year from now, you'll be having another convention, another conference. Ask yourself this question. What will have had to happen in your life 12 months from now to say that you were a success? or your family was a success, or your business was a success. What does that look like to you? Think about it this way. It's still 2017. How many of you have children or grandchildren? So show of hands, children or grandchildren? Most of you, okay. Think about their ages right now. Think about if you have one or two or three, think about their ages. Are they five years old, six, 10, 12, 18? How old are they? Then think about seven years from now, seven years from now in 2024, how old will they be? How old will you be seven years from now? Calculate that in your head. What, what do you look like? Where are you living? What are your relationships like? What is your financial situation like? Are your children happy? Are they married? Are they not married? Are they in businesses that they like? Because it's gonna go in the blink of an eye. I recommend you being the architect and the co-creator of your own life. God put us here on this planet, but he expected us to co-create it with him or her. So that's part of what my message is. By doing well, by doing good, your life can be in order to help others have their life be in order. This is when I got to meet Mr. Warren Buffett. And I remember walking in the room and meeting him. There was about 30 people in the room when I first met him the first time. And I thought, God, I, I should be so nervous. I don't know if I'm honored to be able to meet this man. I don't know if I'm worthy. And that, that thought went out of my head within seconds. It used to stay there for a long time because a long time ago, I used to think that I wasn't worthy, that I wasn't equal to the higher standards of others. But I quickly realized as I got more disciplined and the more I overcame things in my life, I realized I would not have been in that room meeting Mr. Buffett had I not done the work dressed up, showed up, and made a difference to have impact to be able to have met one of the most richest men in the world and then work for him for seven years. Because I knew I was worthy. And you are all worthy. The people we help through Rotary are all worthy, regardless of their economic standard, what their color of skin, their language, their background, their culture, they are all worthy. And what I love about Rotarians is you know that. 
You live that and you know it. So I'm honored to be in this, this esteemed group who is out on a daily and weekly basis and an annual basis making those contributions. Give yourself a huge round of applause for doing that. You guys are really amazing. I'm going to have to buzz through some of these slides here, but one of the things in your own expectations, whether this is in Rotary, your business, or it's in your own life, what do you want to do? Like, what do you want to do in your life? What do you want to have? This usually is something you want to attain or create or have monetarily. And what do you want to be? If someone's to describe you when you walk out of a room or God forbid at your funeral, how would you like them to describe you? What do you want to be? What do you want to have had? And what do you want to do? What does that look like in your life? John Lennon said this, and I love this quote. When I went to school, they asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I wrote down happy. They told me I didn't understand the assignment, and I told them they didn't understand life. Is that great or what? How many of you just want to be happy? How many of you want your children to be happy? Your friends, your neighbors, the people around you? We all want that as human beings. I've been this year in Australia, in the Philippines, in San Diego, in New York, and now uh, India. Every single, it's not India, in, uh, in uh, where am I? Kuala Lumpur, thank you. Uh, I forgot what, where I was at. Um, but we all want that. We all want to be loved. We want to be appreciated. We want to be worthy. We want people to know we're of value and we want to be happy. God wants us to be happy. You find more happiness though. I want to challenge you with a word even beyond happy and that's joyful. It's one thing to be happy. Happiness can be fleeting. Joyfulness is sustaining. Joyfulness is deep. Joyfulness is at the soul level. And when people see that around you and they know if you're joyful and happy, then they know, we already covered this, they know that that's something they want a part of. So when you're leaders and you wanna do well by doing good, People want to know what you won't know. They want to know why you're happy, why you're joyful, why you're living a fulfilled life. So when you're making your goals, let's make sure they're smart. They have to be specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and have timelines. Every single goal, if you do the SMART goal, my, my business coach for many years was a gentleman named Brian Tracy, who's an international writer, author, and speaker. And he uh, used this all the time with me. And it was extremely, extremely helpful. My lead to gold program, here's what I help people with in their businesses. I help people get more productive, more profitable, and more purposeful. And the lead to gold formula has them do that through transitioning, transforming, and evolving by using decision time, time to change, creating systems and steps, getting to the gold, whatever your gold might be. And that process, profit is a good word. I was talking to a few gentlemen, two different gentlemen that had schools. And they have schools and they're there, they're building schools to help children and, and uh, adults actually. And they were a little kind of quiet about that they are also profitable, that the schools are profitable. I said, power to you. Profit is a good word. It's not a shameful word. Rotary needs profit. Rotary needs donations, which is profit. Businesses, corporations need profits. Small entrepreneurs need profits. Governments need profits. Without profits and money, you cannot grow and build and do more. Would you agree with me? So Rotary needs more money. You need more money. I don't personally believe money is the root of all evil. I've heard that in my biblical stuff, but it's been taken out of context. Money is a currency and a vehicle that you can use to do better in the world if you're doing it from the right mindset and from the right heart set. That's why many of you in this room are very successful, wealthy, entrepreneurs, business leaders, and you're using your wealth to do better and inspire others. Looking at my time here. Track and measure. This is something that I do to, to remind myself on a daily basis. Body, being, bonds, and business. I was talking about creating your yearly goals, your monthly goals. Well, on a daily basis, sometimes I get out of whack. Sometimes I'm off track. I don't feel right. I'm not emotionally into it. I've had a stressful week. Uh, a client didn't work out. Something didn't happen. I had a challenge in my family. So I sometimes get off track. Well, I have a daily scorecard. And the daily scorecard is no like when you're, not unlike when your children were in school and they'd get gold stars, they'd come home with a ribbon or they get an A or in school or whatever it might be. So on a daily basis, I'm trying to get to four points a day. 
four points a day in my body, my being, my bonds, and my business. Here's how I define that. I give a half a point broken down. So for my body, remember I told you that I was, you saw pictures how fat I was and I was an alcohol consuming eating guy. I'm now a vegan. I know some of you are vegetarian, but I became vegan two and a half years ago. Talk about intense. Now, when I went to go see my nutritionist and guide and counselor and he advised me, he thought, let's try this vegan thing. I said, doc, what else could I do? Vegan, are you kidding me? No dairy, no meat, no cheese, no eggs. But I tried it for 30 days and after 30 days, oh my God, my energy went through the roof. My clarity of thought, my lightness of being became really intense. I started working out in the morning and the evening and I dropped another 50 or 60 pounds over a year period. And now I said, if that's gonna work, I'm gonna keep my life on track. It also did not start as a spiritual connection. It didn't start the reason some people are vegans, but it became that. Just as many of you do your blessings before you eat and you know that uh, cows are sacred and you know that you bless your food and all of those things that you know, I realized each day that I made a commitment to myself to eat vegan I was honoring myself and I was honoring my higher power and I was honoring my body. And the discipline of that each day got more and more intense and I realized it was a gift to myself. And when I started my own business and I started as a consultant two years ago, I told myself I was gonna make myself my first and number one client. And if I was advising my first and number one client, I would advise them to be in their best health best mental health, best financial health. So I thought I've got to walk my talk. So I get one point by working out each day and eating vegan. I then have to, my being, I have to pray daily, meditate daily, and I have to do something of spiritual significance that shows my faith to other people throughout the day. And if I'm making those efforts, I get a half a point, a half a point. My bonds are my relationships. I get a half a point to make sure the people within my immediate family know that I love and care about them. I have to do something of significance each day with a hug, a kiss, a note, a card, a Facebook post, uh, a, 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 an encouragement, and I have to do something outside of my immediate family. That's a, if that's a very clear gesture that other people know that as well. And then the last one is my business. Most of us are very busy working in our businesses. We're running the restaurants, we're running the engineering companies, we're running the construction companies, whatever it might be, and we're running in our business, we're running our business, but we're not always working on our businesses. What you're doing here is working on Rotary's business. You're planning for the future. You're making efforts to collectively put your consciousness together. And you should be doing that also in your own businesses where you're working on your business and thinking about what you can do to create more opportunities for the future. Check my time here. And so I have a daily scorecard. And I'm just trying to get to four points. And at the end of each week, I'm trying to get to 28 points. I don't always get to 28 points. I get to 25, 23, 22, 21 and a half but I'm measuring it and I'm tracking it. And if I'm off course, then I know I need to get back on course. When a plane takes off from Los Angeles to New York in the United States, it's off course 98% of the time. It just has to keep course correcting, course correcting, course correcting. And that's what this helps you do. Um, this is also when you're using your time. Many of you within these Rotarians, I sometimes don't know how you do it. You're running businesses, you're running families, you're going to meetings, you're serving Rotary Foundation opportunities, you're having networking and fellowship stuff. That is a lot of time. Stephen Covey, has anyone ever read the book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? A few of you. If you've not read that book, highly recommend it. Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He breaks time down into quadrants. What's important and urgent? What's important and not urgent? What's not important but urgent? And what's not urgent and not important at all? We spend too much of our time in categories that are not important and urgent, and we don't spend enough time, and we spend way too much time in things that are not important and not urgent. So this is a whole, we could spend hours on this, but I wanted to bring this concept that your time is valuable, and the time that you donate to Rotary is valuable, and this organization is valuable. So figuring out how to manage your time, because time is effort and money, and you can't get it back, this is something that I want all of you to be recognized for, that you're giving your time and you're making a contribution, and I know that that's a value. We also have to continue to redefine, recommit, and results. This never ends. This process in life, we're like, oh God, when does this ever end? It doesn't. Unless you believe in reincarnation, which many of you do, and so do I. That helps me have a different perspective on realizing that this is a cycle of life. In this lifetime that I am, 
I realized I was looking through my fat pictures the other day. I thought, God, maybe in a past life, like I was like a beggar, had no food and was poverty. And in this life, I'm trying to make up for it. I don't know. Um, but, you know, each of these things have to continue to go through this process and cycle. And so for you, what are you going to do next? When you leave this meeting today for Rotary or for your businesses, what are some things you can do that you can put in motion? Completing a goal sheet, communicate, joining a mastermind group, whatever it might be. Take an action step. It has to start today. Make a different behavior that's going to help you move forward to what you want. Um, so the goal is what you're going to have for each quarter. We've got to make sure these goals are happening. You have to review them monthly. Um, and these goals are something, again, as I said, never ends. What happens when your goals that you made all of a sudden don't work out? Has anyone ever had a situation that you've had to fire somebody? Anybody? Has any of you ever been fired? How does that feel? How does that feel when you get fired? Anybody enjoy that process? <laughs> no? Well, that happened to me. After building that company I told you about that I worked for Prudential California Realty that eventually got warned uh, by Warren Buffett, I worked there a total of 15 years. And in 2007 and 8, when I was the CEO, the real estate market went in the tank. It was crashing around everywhere. One of the things I had to do as the CEO, we had grown to 110 offices. We had 5,000 salespeople. We were doing 25 billion a year in sales volume, selling 40,000 houses a year. And the corporate headquarters, not Warren Buffett, but the people under him said, cut, 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 cut. So my team and I had to close 50 of the 100 offices within about eight months. Lay people off, cut people, fire people. It was brutal. And the real estate market was going just in the tank. A week before Christmas, all of a sudden they came to me and said, Steve, you're out. We're putting the guy in under you that makes half the money you make. Thank you very much. See you later. Bye. Wow. Wow. In that moment, I thought, I have a choice. I can either be devastated, betrayed, uh, whatever this is going to feel like. Wow. Or I can realize, you know what? They didn't just fire a CEO. They just birthed an entrepreneur. That's what they did. And I went out and started my own real estate company in the worst real estate market that existed that I'd ever worked in in 25 years. And within 18 months, we built our company to 500 real estate agents. We were doing a billion dollars a year in sales volume in San Diego. Um, and I was extremely honored to have had that opportunity to work for Mr. Buffett and then run my own real estate company. But I couldn't have done that without perspective. I want to use the Google Earth app. Can you guys pull up the Google, uh, Google Earth uh, thing for me? So think about this. How many of you ever heard of Google Earth? It's a thing where you get, it's a satellite up in the sky that's there in the, in the sky and the satellites right now. And this is an actual picture. This is a live picture of where you're at. Where, see, there's Sunway Lagoon. There's a Sunway main entrance. And you're sitting in one of those buildings right now. Now zoom that up a little bit. There's another perspective. That's a bird's eye if you're flying up. A little bit higher. A little bit higher. Keep going. All of a sudden, you're getting a view of the city. Your view is changing. Your perspective is changing. Let's zoom it up further. You're seeing freeways. Keep going. You're seeing waterways. Whoa, there's the ocean. Keep going. We're going to zoom up. We're outside of Kuala Lumpur. All of a sudden, wow, we've got more water. Keep zooming up. Zoom up further. Keep going. Whoa, stop there. Look at that. We're looking at Cambodia. We see Thailand. I met a gentleman earlier in the restroom from Sri Lanka. There's your country. Wow, what a different perspective. What a different perspective. Keep going. Wow, look at that. There's our world. There's Yemen. There's Kenya. Keep going. Malaysia. Different perspective. Now you're sitting up on the bird perch looking down onto this world. Wow, look how powerful that is. Do you think your perspective changes sitting in this seat versus looking at it from up there? Does your perspective change on what's possible? Every problem that you have, every situation that you have, Basker was talking about this yesterday. I immediately look for solutions. How do we make this happen? The way I was over to come being fired was to look at opportunities of how I could see this differently, changing my perspective. And also looking at this at a higher consciousness. I also believe that everything happens for a reason. Every single thing. It's my purpose to find out why and how and what's the purpose of that. And within that, then I can help people make a difference. I've got about 15 minutes here. I want to spend some time with you guys in wrapping up. Can we jump uh, forward to that? From that perspective, one of the things that 
after I built my company, this is one of my offices. We also helped. This is doing well by doing good. I wanted to talk about this. One of the things Basker asked me to, Basker asked me to talk about was how do you do well by doing good? And how does that pay off in the future to pay it forward? Where after I was a president and CEO and I got fired and I had to start my company, all of a sudden I needed help. I wanted to build escrow companies and title companies and I was building a lifestyle services company. Because of the efforts I had made to help other people in the past, it was amazing how many people were lined up to help me. And when I decided to build my own company, success became very rapid. And I realized all the karma that I had created and good karma of doing well by doing good and treating people with respect, many of those people that I had to fire, unfortunately, along the way, some of my friends and associates and attorneys and executives, eventually ended up coming to work for me afterwards. Because when you do well by doing good, it works in your business, it works in your life, it works in your family. This is my wife, Mary Lou. One of the things I know is important to all of you is family. And that's very important to me. We've been married 28 years. And when you realize the importance of marriage and a commitment and partnership and what that looks like, that's extremely valuable in helping you get through each day and to create dreams and to enjoy successes and challenges. One of the things that I know is that my relationship with my higher power is the most important thing to me in all that I do. I know that I'm responsible for everything that happens and I know that I have a choice. And I know that I'm worthy. So when I just turned 55 years old about a few weeks ago. And I'm in better health and a better place in my life at 55 than I was 45. So my goal is to continue to transform. And I've, there's a lot more things on here we don't have time to go through. But some of the other things I know is that successful people are usually willing to share their success if you ask for help. Rotarians need help. You want to offer help. You want to make things happen for others. So I recommend that you make that message knowing that as I give, I do receive. And I have heard that talked about many times here. So uh, we've got to jump through Basker. So let's wrap up then and go to, we don't have time for this video, but let's jump to the very end here because I want to wrap on this. Because we have a great Western disease that you may not have here where you're at, but we have this thing about I'll be happy when. I'll be happy when, when I get to this point. Uh, and our employees sometimes happen that I'll be engaged when. How do we make that happen and how do we change that? Well, if we go through the power of understanding that Rotary, now a hundred year plus organization that helps people on many, many levels, um, is a way that can help people be happy now, be of service now. And this is uh, some of the things in uh, Basker when he was in the Philippines, they were giving around trophies and awards for people who had done good in the world and acknowledging who they were and what they did. And I was so honored by that. I was actually in the Philippines able to go when they donated houses they had just built. We had a ribbon cutting there. Um, these are some of the children that we were able to help through that being happy now. Um, uh, another organization I'm involved in is Junior Achievement, which helps a lot of people throughout the world. But let's jump to one of the things I want to end with is uh, let's see here if we get to the end. We have, I want to end on a video. Well, actually, listen to this. So six, I want to ask yourself these questions of yourselves. When will I be happy? What can I do to be happy each day? What can I do to find meeting each day? What can I do to be fully engaged? What can I do to have positive relationships? What can I do to set clear goals? And how do we make sure that all these things stay on target? So you want to hit your bullseye each and every day to making sure you're focused on those things. So as we jump through to the, this is my daughter who I jumped out of the plane with, Nicole. Uh, this is us later on after we uh, decided we want to fly in a biplane. So I clearly got over my fears of that because fear leads you to new opportunities and new things. Um, these are my grandchildren. Uh, but the message here that I want to share with you is the power of one. This is my little grand cove, son Cove. But my book is called Lead to Gold. Um, and if you want to get that on Amazon, you can. But I want to end on this note, the power of one. All of you in this room have a difference to affect a lot of people. You may be a Rotarian. You may be a spouse of a Rotarian. You may be thinking about becoming a Rotarian. You may have been a Rotarian for a very long time. I know you're trying to bring a lot of other Rotarians in. And the power of one of what people can do to make a difference in the world is extremely impactful. Each of you in this room, each of you sitting in this seat have the opportunity to change lives. And this video, it's only a couple minutes and we'll wrap on this, is something that I think will probably resonate with all of you. So let's go ahead and show this. Whoop. Can you guys click on that and play it?
सर आपके लिए उस पार कार का इंतजाम किया है सर सर आइए सर ये चल चल क्या बात क्या 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 ऊपर से जाएगा कुछ करो ना मैं वहां जाके क्या हूं कैसी जाने बूंदे आई जाने कैसा दर्द लाई सामने क्या है ये तेरे से तू ढूंढता है वो ही है तू तू वही है कुछ में तेरा रास्ता है कुछ में तेरा है सहारा तू ही तुझको पार लेगा तू ही है तेरा किनारा Has anyone ever seen that video before? Is that good? So again, I think that's a lot of what you do in Rotary. Just one little kid thought, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this or not, but he got out and started pushing that log, didn't he? He didn't know if anyone was going to help him or not. He didn't know if he was going to have any followers or additional leaders. All of a sudden people said, well, God, I guess I'll push it too. I guess I'll push it too. What were they able to do? They moved it out of the road to break resistance and to allow things to move forward in life. And that's again what you do at Rotary. And I'm so honored to be here with your group. And just remember this. This is John Wesley. He was from the 1700s. And his father was a clergyman, but he went on to be a philosopher and a writer. And this is, again, I read this quote and I thought, this is exactly how I want to wrap up the conference for you guys. And this is exactly what you already do. So I want to applaud you for number one, being who you are and what you do. But do all the good work you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can in all the places that you can, at all the times that you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. Thank you, Rotarians, and keep doing the good work that you do in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much.